welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Andrew Farleno of Trained Monkey Blade Co., I've been following Andrew and Trained Monkey for a couple of years now, having been initially drawn in by their obviously combat-oriented designs. But what keeps me consistently excited about their knives is the contrast uh, between their unapologetically aggressive profiles and their undeniably pretty and refined looks. Uh, Think scary blade, precise grind, beautiful handle. We'll meet Andrew and find out where the idea for Trained Monkey Blade Co. originated and what it's like been building a family business. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and you can download the show to your favorite podcast app. Uh, Also, if you want to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Andrew, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Bob, that was like beautiful intro. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Like, you know, it, 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 what's that? I could have said it better myself. Ah, yeah, it, it wrote itself, man. Just looking at your at your blades, which I have to say, uh, like I said, it's been a few years, and uh, and I think I've seen them grow or or become. Uh, evolved. But before we get to any of that, uh, let me first say thank you for your service. You're you're a former uh, U.S. Marine, and uh, um, Marines have a have a close place to my heart. You keep us safe, etc. So I I really appreciate your service, sir. Hey, not a problem. I mean, uh, I tell people all the time it was the best lifestyle, so I couldn't have asked for more. And uh, I enjoyed it so much, so I feel selfish when finding people like you say thank you. So, <laughs> well, hey, it, it it works if it if both of us uh, gain from it. That's the best way. Well, uh, let's get into uh, how you came up with the idea, because from looking at your website, I have a, I have an inkling, but, but fill us in on how this happened. You know, it's a, it's a long time coming. So I served from 2004 to 2013. And during that time being an infantry Marine, a grunt, a machine gunner, I, it's funny when people think of Marines because we're the first to fight, we're the shock troops, yet we get the worst gear and equipment, and that's including blades. Uh, we were issued blades. I won't name the companies. Uh, it is what it is. It's government contracts. But we were just issued knives that were just total garbage. And being overseas, you use a knife all the time, daily, multiple times a day. And a lot of times it's not for knife related purposes. It's you're opening ammo cans or MREs or you're digging in the dirt with them. And they were just failing. They were just breaking. So I knew I could make them, but I just didn't know how. Right. It was I'm busy. I'm always deployed or training. But when I'd get free time and I'd actually be back stateside, I was fortunate enough that there was a place on Marine Corps Base Hawaii called the Hobby Shop. And the Hobby Shop, imagine this full suite of car bays, equipment, welders. You could take your car in there, work on it for free, and you'd have these old retired Marines kind of to show you. But they also had like a paint shop, a ceramic studio, but then they had like this dingy old like warehouse dungeon and i took one look in it and it was a blacksmith studio and it was just awesome right so one day i was actually building a hot rod at the time so that's why i was there and while i'm working on my car i'm just like you know i'm gonna go and see what this is about and i walk in and i mean just imagine the most crusty old marine that's who was running the place just this hard looking individual and I asked him what it is and he said blacksmith and I said what do you do and he's like I make knives and then that was the beginning of my knowledge of knives but he was very honest with me he's like I don't make good ones but I know how to make them so he showed me the basics and after that I was just hooked just absolutely hooked I mean it was so fun 
it not only was it you're learning and creating your also it's like therapy it's stress release it's it's all of these things that every creative person needs to occupy their mind and and go on you know and be happy and vent and decompress and do all these things that artists do but mine was just making knives a tool and it just skyrocketed from there well, as we uh, before we started rolling, I mentioned to you I have interviewed and become friends with so many uh, former Marines who make knives, and um, it, it's amazing. I mean, disproportionately uh, more Marines than any other branch, and uh, and I, I have some theories growing. Part of it is the love of weaponry, which uh, uh, I'm sure many Marines have, you but sure? also uh, I, I think that there's an orderliness to it. Uh, that I've I've witnessed I've noticed in every Marine I've I've ever met. It's it's discipline that there's no denying it. You know, and Jocko Willing, for example, he has the saying "discipline equals freedom," and it's true. It's if you're disciplined enough to wake up early, you get more done through the day. If you're disciplined enough enough to study whatever trade or whatever you want to do, you're going to excel. And knife making, although there's like secrets and magic that people say the truth is it's just a discipline trade craft that you have to follow somewhat rules in order to make it successful so discipline yes i mean it's like step by step it's your process right uh it's your process but you're also inheriting some of it and then you're making it your own um uh, is is what I assume. Oh, yeah. It's like with most things. Uh, uh -huh. But let's go back to to when you were deployed. You were talking about the crap knives you were uh, uh, issued, and you don't want to mention the companies, and that's fine. But we all know. <laughs> but uh, where were they breaking? Like how how and where were they breaking on the knife? Well, I, everything from simple to extremely dramatic. Simple ones would be you go and you know you have to uh, open up a lid on like a 50 cal ammo can and they have these little wire tabs on them so you would stick your knife and sometimes not even the tips they would break like halfway through the blade or yeah. bend to then eod technicians would be digging in the dirt and they would you know they're probing for ieds or they're finding trip wires and they would get it stuck maybe under a rock and they would try to crank it out and literally banana the knife so i mean it's and that's no exaggeration it's <laughs> so do you think that's poor heat treat for um uh due to like the numbers you know you're we got to make well, fifty thousand of these things that it could be a lot of things you know numbers is huge so uh, some stuff slips i do know of one company though that issued knives to us and about six years later we came to find out through the company actually dissolved uh, they were receiving just terrible metal from overseas. So yeah. that could be something too, you know? Yeah. Well, let's go back to that crusty shop where you had your first introduction to knife making. Uh, you said it all clicked there. What, uh, what exactly clicked and, and, how, and how did that, uh, evolve into your current day process? The, it was an intimate thing. I mean, knives, it's widely considered the knife is the oldest purpose-built tool. And so there's something very intimate about making a knife and it's hard to explain, but when you make this knife from scratch, it's almost like you're connecting to the past. And for me, when I was making these knives, I mean, in the first hundreds were not too good. And yet I felt so accomplished. I felt like I was doing something significant, even though I was making the oldest purpose built tool in, this, in existence. For me, it was like, it was purpose. Hmm. I could do a lot of things, whether it's in academics or sports or the military, but for me making knives, I mean, it really fulfilled my heart. It just felt right and good. And when your mind and your heart are like this. And then finally they intersect. I mean, man, that's a good feeling, right? So and everybody, I think everybody kind of finds that in life, whether it's very early or later. So I just so happen to find it like mid twenties. Yeah. I mean, hopefully everyone, everyone <laughs> yeah. finds that. I mean, that's uh, that's 
great when those things intersect. Um, you're, you were talking about the connection to the past and that, and that made my mind go into a whole bunch of different places. But um, I think of uh, certain knife makers come to mind uh, with that. Um, and, and that connection to the past is so powerful. And I think that people who use knives on a regular basis, um, such as uh, military people uh, who have a, a life or death connection with that tool, not necessarily like they're getting in fights with it, but they're, op they're, they're doing things uh, in their day to day that if they can't accomplish, they're in trouble sure. and they're relying on this tool. And, uh, that is uh that is something that so i daniel winkler is a guy who oh, looks yeah. to the past and his his knives you still see it you know um i see some of that in in your knives too tell me about your your style and how you developed it i developed it through a lot of failures like <laughs> i mean endless endless times in the shop of failures and i tell people all the time you know it's it's an everyday pursuit and yet there are buckets full. I mean, yeah, that's a metaphor, but there's bucket full of failures uh, in our shop. But for me, I would say we're Japanese aesthetics and performance with military grade hardware and purpose, right? I love Japanese aesthetics. I love Japanese craftsmanship and really, you know, the Kaizen concept perfection with failures and always trying to really achieve that even though it's not possible right and so for me i mean i grew up watching rambo and commando and all these things but i also grew up watching you know hari Kari and seppuku and 13 samurai and all these japanese films and i just looked at their weapons and they were so beautiful and I knew I wanted to recreate that with my own style, with a military influence into it. So for us, it's very Japanese aesthetics, yet you've seen we're not shy on using wild materials. Mm -hmm. And really, that's kind of our design philosophy, though, because we're one of the few, if not, I, you know, you have so much so maybe your research says otherwise but i don't know too many other custom like tactical knife makers that you could go to the website the customer could say i want that one but i want this done to it and we say okay so they pick a profile if they want like i mean i've had requests for grandfather's ashes to be put in knife handles to wow. under shredded hundred dollar bills to the wildest things and i'm like let's do it right like why not? Who am I to say no? It pushes our our envelope on our skill set too. So it's always a learning experience. Yeah, yeah. Send a whole bunch of extra hundred dollar bills because we haven't done this before. There might be a failure rate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Th so this is where I'm. I'm. Uh, so the the you know what when I was describing your knives up front, that scary blades. You know the Raiden is my favorite. I love a double edged tanto, and yeah. so few people do it. Um, so. Uh, that's that's my pick so far <laughs> um but uh so scary profiles uh also extreme like uh your um it, it's a a quaken style that's just so long and slender it's it's the bushido just, the yeah. bushido yes yeah. it's terrifying just to look at so <laughs> scary profiles but then when you look at the hollow ground blades i remember when i first started following you that was uh, i was rediscovering the hollow grind and i was like oh my gosh uh, everything I wanted, everything with a hollow grind, and I, I really um, I admired yours because yeah. they seem so precise. They look so precise. Uh, this is the one right here, the Raiden. This is yeah, that's that's a bad boy right there. I love that. That's my wife's oh, favorite too. Oh God, that is cool. Um, so uh, yeah, taken in by the by the nasty shape because I love I love tactical. I love combat fighting knives. It's just my taste. It's not that I'm out there fighting with them. It's just my taste. So I love the way they, uh, the, the aggressive profile and then that super precise hollow grind and the, and your plunge line is always immaculate, everything. Uh, and then the handle is the wild card. It's, it's <laughs> where, it's where things go crazy. And I really like that. Uh, tell me about that contrast. Well, it's like a, a real good example is our seppuku model 
it's based off the traditional Japanese like fighting tanto of like five to six inch blade, right? So we take a traditional design, but then we develop geometry that allows it to be extremely sharp, but also like user friendly in the field. Because what you'll notice a lot of times is some grinds are, are like so extreme that the user really can't sharpen them. So the seppuku, we take it and we take that hollow grind all the way up to the spine. But if you've also noticed on our tantos, we don't have that distinguishing line that separates the tip mm -hmm. from the belly of the blade. Our hollow grind goes all the way to the tip. And the reason why we do this is we've tested out so many different grinds Oh, and this allows the tip to be extremely strong on a tanto style, like very, very strong. It also makes the tip very a lot thinner, I it would does. imagine, and probably penetrates a lot better. It does. You know, and even our Fenrir, that's based off the Finnish Puko design. Oh, yeah. And yet that hollow grind is super dramatic, uh, super steep. So all the way from our belly to our tip, we just try to maintain that edge geometry that's just like a razor blade and i'm gonna let you in on a secret though the reason why we do a hollow grind is yeah it looks awesome but the truth is is when i learned i i was terrible at flat grinds <laughs> i was like terrible man so i started hollow grinding and i heard all these nightmarish stories about hollow grinds how hard they were and it just clicked for me so early on in my knife making journey I started hollow grinding because I was terrible at flat. <laughs> <laughs> How about that, because <laughs> you know? that is the reverse of what you often hear. People it usually is, yeah. start the other way around and and make their way to hollow grind. That's uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that. Um, and then and then you get to the handle, right? Mm -hmm. And and okay, okay. So first of all, I was on your website uh, today just to brush up, and I was like, it, it reminded me. My dad went through a period of time. Uh, where he, he loved Bentleys, you know, Bentley cars. And he wasn't going to go out and buy a Bentley, but he'd go to the website and he'd say, hmm, I think I would get this color with this leather. And he said, Bob, this is, this is going to be my Bentley. I was like, okay, dad, I'll get it for you. But that was that was the experience going on your website. I was like, oh, I'd get 80 CRV. Ooh, 3V? Maybe I'd get 3V. And because uh, you offer four different steels and then you offer four different coatings or three different coatings and then a host of uh, different blade handles and then a couple of other things. Um, how, how are you able to do that e efficiently? It's, it's tough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's real tough, but uh, you could get onto our website and just like you said, you could see all those standard options and, but then you get onto our Instagram and you're like, well, there's so much more to this. And what we offer though is, a client to pick that standard option, but then also at the very end of the order process, there's a note section and it specifically states, if you want anything done to your blade, including coatings or handles or carry options, write down to the best of your description and knowledge and I'll get back to them. So they submit an order, it emails me and I look at the email and then I personally contact the customer. Mm -hmm. and we just talk Be and the reason why i want to do this is i mean if you look at say one of these blades and it's 350 dollars, it could go up in cost but the reality is is for most people 350 dollars is a lot of money mm -hmm. especially for a knife and most people that we do business with they're buying this as like a graduation gift they're buying it as like a, a present for their husband or a gift for you know their deployed son or daughter so we want to offer them a full suite full bespoke custom blade at a very reasonable cost but with a warranty that ensures that they really have a good peace of mind and the reality is is so many people said don't offer that level of custom experience because it's going to be a headache mm -hmm. but we've developed our own processes that my wife and I, we really, it really fuels us and our purpose behind the business to offer that. So it's become this thing of a little bit of headache, but 
so much customer service and respect and love that has come back to us that has then created repeat customers. Mm -hmm. And for us, that's such a beautiful thing. And it's no longer a headache. The process is so refined and so easy now. But initially when we started doing it, it was just via Instagram. And that was tough because there's so many things and options out there that people want and going through Instagram messaging, you know, a hundred oh. messages, it, it was terrible. So now the website has really streamlined the process and we have different things we do with ordering and with vendors. So that helps too. Well, uh, you mentioned, well, first of all, I just want to say like when you start your own business, you get to decide what kind of business uh, you want to make it. Um, and you get to decide the kind of customer experience you want your customer to have. And most likely that's based on the kind of experience you yourself want to have. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the challenge is, of course, to make it fly. Um, part of the way you make it fly, you just mentioned, is your wife. I think a big part of how you make it fly. And um, you mentioned that the two of you came up with the process. And I'm interested in that because, um, you know, my wife is, we, we have, we both are strong people with our strengths and she has her strengths and, and I have mine and hers is the organization and that yeah. kind of <laughs> process creating, uh, what was it like, what is it like working with your wife and how has, uh, what has she brought to your business? So initially my wife and I, we worked for a different company <laughs> doing very weird things for government research and design projects. So we already worked together in although a limited capacity, she was quality control. I was research development maintenance, right? But we already worked together and we loved working together. I mean, she's my best friend. So when we started this business, it was always a goal of making a family business that we could give to our kids. Mm -hmm. But initially we know what we have to do and it has to be, we have to work together. We have to make this cohesive and everything. So, Working with my wife is like this dream. And I'll tell you why is because she levels me out in ways that I don't. She has this organization and this ability and this attention for detail. And her eyes see things differently than mine. And it's noticeable throughout the day. But then it's also, she's very behind the scenes in the shop. She's in the shop working with me. I mean, it's just today we busted out like 50 sheets, right? Mm. For a big order. And she's doing things and learning and I'm doing things and learning. And collectively we come together to make this happen. And she has her thoughts on the business and I have my thoughts on the business. But at the end of the day, it's all about how we make it successful because we want to pass it to our kids. So the truth is, is it's not possible without her, but I'm also very like sad and depressed when she's not in the shop. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, like it's just, I just need her there, you know? Yeah. It's yeah, just I do. companion and company and attention to detail and a different set of eyes and hands on the product. Uh, <clears throat> I think in anything, I mean, whether, whether it's a family business or not having, having a partner that you can work with who you're friends with, but also the, uh, someone who will uh, balance out whatever your deal is uh, a good working relationship is uh, invaluable it and is. Uh, you know, can make, can make, can give you uh, put wind in your sails and, and it, when things are tough too. Um, I want to talk about your process, like actually how the knives are made and how they're designed. Uh, I guess let's start with design. Like where, where do they come from? And are you a drawer or, or, or a draftsman or are you a computer guy? Um, tell me about your design process a little bit and the inspiration. Yeah. I mean, typically a design pops in my head about 1030 at night and then I can't sleep, you know, <laughs> and, and I speak. I spend all night staring at the ceiling, thinking about like, how can I make this work? Uh, proportions and geometry. And that's just the way my mind works. Initially, most designs are, just come from us. It's like, I want to make a drop point blade this length. I want it to look different and perform different. I want these materials to be different than anything that anybody's doing, right? 
or what's happened as of recently is companies or other people will come to us and say, Hey, I want something along these parameters. Can you make this happen? So then I'll take their feedback and design a knife. Now I don't draw and I'm not a computer guy. And there's a website called knifeprint.com and it's a 2d CAD design system. And I just design all my knives to the <laughs> CAD DXF files. That way I could, you know, print them out to scale. And it's a very good website. It's very limited, but it does what most knife makers need. It provides drawings. So we do that. I print them out to scale. I'll make test samples and test and test and test until it's good to go with us. And then after that, Typically, that first like three or four we make, it's just what I want. It's the materials I want. And then we'll put it on our Instagram or we'll promote it and then put it on our website. And then people could buy that profile. So how how do you make the knives? Do you, uh, is this stock removal or is it forging? I know you do some forging and mm -hmm. how does that work? So we do forging and those are for very different projects. I mean, if a guy wants a Mokume blade, if you want San Mai, right. there's certain things that you have to forge out. But we got to this point in our business where people, they no longer wanted a forge knife. They wanted 10 or 15 of the same. Mm -hmm. It was batch process orders. So we do stock removal. And we do all of our grinding, all of our surface finishing, everything prior to heat treat. So that's something also very different than most. Most makers heat treat, then they grind, then they finish. We do all of our work, 99% of it prior to heat treating because it's so important. The heat treat is the heart of the blade. And no matter how much cooling systems you use, no matter what your pressures are like, no matter how much material you have to remove, inevitably you could always risk messing the heat treat up by putting the blade to the grinder. Mm -hmm. So we do everything. And then our final step is heat treat. Now we have developed a process that limits warpage and limits the anomalies that can happen during heat treat, but it's still not perfect. Nothing is. So we stock removal, get geometry, right? Heat treat. And then we do some things that are final fit and finish to ensure the blade is like true and perfect. Well, as perfect as we could do by hand. And that's the thing though, is all of these knives are 100% by hand. Blades are ground by hand, handles are ground, finished by hand, sheaths by hand. I mean, everything. There's zero automation. So uh, the the idea of uh, heat treating last makes sense to me in that steel is easier to grind when it's not heat treated. Maybe you go through fewer expendables like um, like belts and such. Uh, but but you run the risk of of putting all that time and energy into it and then having something go wrong with the heat treat does that happen it used to yeah i mean that's like where the bucket of failures comes from i mean <laughs> just blade after blade and but there was always i i talked to a lot of very old school knife makers when i first started and the ones that i really their knives were just so beautiful and their performance was amazing I would talk to them and they're like, you have to develop a heat treat process after most of your work. And so I really took that and I was like, I need to do this. But all of them were truthful with me. They're like, it's you, you're going to have to do it so you understand it. And so it's always consistent. And so we've developed that process. And I would say out of about 100 blades that we make, we'll probably lose two or three in the heat treat process so there there are some blades that we just toss and that's to be expected 
Well, so uh, from your perspective, why do you think uh, you said most knife makers do it the other way? Why do you think that? Why do you think they do it that way? I think, I think a lot of knife makers, it's very comforting for them to know that they could heat treat a blank, their stock, and it's a big slab of metal and it's square and there's no edges and they could heat treat it and put it in a big vise and make sure it's flat and straight and true. And then after that, they could take it to like a surface grinder and make sure it's true both sides. They could mark their center line and grind and they could ensure it's true. Um, And so don't get me wrong though. There's so many knife makers out there that are phenomenal at that. I mean, industry known people to cutting edge type people, but for us, it's just so much more beneficial, especially being like a bespoke knife, custom knife maker to do heat treat last because we could always ensure that heat treat is perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I get what you mean. Like when you have a big, <clears throat> excuse me, a thick slab of steel or, or an unground, um, uh, piece of steel that's heat treated, uh, you can, um, well, you don't have to worry. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is when you when you grind it, you if there's less material, if it's thinner material, it's more likely to warp, I would imagine, yes. yeah. than just a big fat slab of steel. Um, so I could see wanting that assurance, but the whole time you got to be nervous. Am I am I jacking up the heat treat? You know? Yeah, you do for sure. Yeah. Well, um, so uh, once you get the once you get the uh, um, I'm sorry, the profile of it cut out, mm-hmm. you take it to the grinder, you do everything. When you say the finish work, you're not talking about the coating naturally. You're talking about the, uh, the grinding, getting the, getting the blade itself mm-hmm. uh, good to go. And then you heat, heat treat it. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, do you do any sort of testing for the, for, you know, test the heat treat and all that? We do. We do we do Rockwell hardness on every blade, which is kind of like the the standard. Mm -hmm. Um, We also do bend and stress tests. And in fact, I have a few videos on my Instagram of what we do test wise. And it's like a full 90 degrees bend both ways. It has to always return to true. Uh, We do that to, there's a few things that I guess they're kind of our secret, but it's what, (laughs) I learned with metallurgy in my past career that we implement in that process for heat treat for final testing. And it's, I don't really want to say, <laughs> I got you. I got you. I really I, what, want to say on that because it's not used in the knife world. It's used in the aerospace world with magnesiums and titanium. So we do that for our heat treat and that ensures uniformity. Because a heat treat could be beautiful and perfect from the outside, but sometimes the core is a different story. Mm. And there are times if you break a blade open where you'll have grain structure that will actually be going four to five different ways, just not enlarged or just not small. You will could actually see under like a microscope on the edges, that outer cladding will be one way. The core will be a different way. And then like the two little sandwich layers in between will be scrambled. So there's ways that we test to ensure the uniformity of the heat treat is good to go. So there's just little tricks of the trade. That's cool. You know, uh, there, there are a bunch of, uh, old, not, I would say old timers, but guys like Ernest Emerson, he was in, he was in, um, aero, aerospace engineering and stuff before he got in a uh, last, so many interesting people, uh, with doing interesting things, going yeah. to knife making, I, yeah. you know, like, I don't know. I think that's, uh, that's pretty cool. So, uh, how did it come to be that you decide, okay, we're, we're going to do a business and it's going to be a knife company and let's go for it. Let's quit our jobs and do this. How did that decision happen? It was my wife. It, it really was. So I made knives when I was in the Marines for my Marine buddies. And it was just like, here's, Like the truth is, here's this kind of like junky knife I'm learning. Right. And I would give it to them and they just give me feedback. And, you know, Marines, it was honest feedback. So (laughs) they're like, do this or do that. So I developed 
kind of the aesthetics and the performance of the brand initially. But then I stopped making knives. Life took over. I had different careers. But then I met my wife and she's like, what do you do? And I was like, well, I do this and this, but I also like to make knives. And she was so interested in it. I mean, she's like, wow, that's awesome. That's cool. So for the first three, four years of our relationship, we just had a home-based shop that was just something where I could mess around with. And the knives started getting better. But she always believed in me initially. But me, I was like, oh, man, these aren't too good. Like, I need to develop the skill set and I, I need to be consistent with it. So over the course of about two years of kind of just messing around with knives out of our home base shop, they started getting really good and people started to notice. And then we started getting orders with zero promotions, zero media, zero website. People were just contacting us. Hey, can you make me a knife? So when you make something with your hands, it's amazing. But when somebody wants to buy it, Hmm. that's a different story. Yeah. There's a lot of things that go into that. I mean, everything has to be transparent, integrity, customer service, all of these things. But we already dealt with all of that in our prior career. So we kind of knew what needed to happen. And then I was fortunate. I have this amazing friend of mine, a childhood friend, and his name's Cody Bunderson. And he owns a large business in one day he asked me, what do you need? And I was like, man, I'm running out of space. I, I need power and I need air conditioning and I need I need heat. I don't have that at my home base shop. And so he's like, come over to my facility and take a look around. So we actually went to his facility and he had this storage room slash empty bay in his facility. And he's like, take it, man, remodel it, make it yours. So it's like three phase power. It's climate controlled, which is actually very important for epoxies and resins and heat treat mm -hmm. and all this stuff, stuff that you don't think about initially. So then we remodeled and we started this new facility. And then after that, we reached out to some folks and made some collaborations and we started to realize People don't want one or two. They want 50 or 60 <laughs> at a time for either their companies or to buy and give to their industry partners. And we just couldn't keep up. And so recently, my wife and I were like, we have to do this full time. Like it's all or nothing. It's now or never. Let's do it. I mean, if we're successful, amazing. If we fell guess what? At least we said we did it. Yeah. We tried. And the reality is, is we still can't keep up. And it's not, that's like not bragging. It's two issues is our commitment to quality and everything is a hundred percent handmade. So when you're getting orders of like 60 blades, that's 60 hand sandings, that's 60 custom handles. I mean, it's, it could be a lot for two people. All right. Well, so this is interesting because you mentioned early on that making a knife is an intimate process. Mm -hmm. Actually, two people making 60 knives, that's an intimate process. Mm -hmm. um, how, do you tr how do you think you continue translating the intimacy into uh, numbers? You know what I mean? Because the numbers uh, obviously... Uh, preclude intimacy in, in a, in a sense. So they can, how does that work? And you know, you can get burnout when you do large batch orders. Uh, the thing though, that we always talk about and strive about is initially it was the blade. We make this product and we want to make it the best that we can, but the last about year and a half, two years, it's actually became that customer relation. Now, when we do business with these other companies or we do collaborations, we want them to be so proud to work with us and be an industry partner that if you're doing 50 blades, you're still treating them as a one-off 
completely bespoke custom blade because you really want to make that person proud because it's also when you start getting into the money thing behind business, a lot of people get really scared about that. I'm not scared about taking a person's like a business's money. If they want 50 blades, I'm scared of delivering a product that they can't be proud of to offer their people. So it's just a constant, constant striving to make that these people proud. I mean, it's their hard earned money and then it's our family business. So mm -hmm. if we can't make it work and if we can't make them happy, then it's like a, a lose lose on our end. So burnout's a big thing, but treating it as every time a person buys a blade, it's an heirloom. They could pass it to yeah. a family member, a friend. It that's what motivates us. So even uh, if if I'm to buy your most basic model with black G10, that's mm -hmm. going to be uh, to me, that's going to be a huge deal. It's yeah. a custom knife. Even if it's the plain, the most plain custom knife you're going to make all year, it's still custom knife. And it's there's no one, no other one quite like it. And right. that's why people like custom knives. They also like it for what you just said, the business relationship. I mean, that's uh, that is huge. That is a huge thing that uh, uh, you can't replace. No, you can't. And we've made so many amazing friends that they're actually friends now. Initially, it's business transaction. We want a cool blade. Here's our money. And now it's like, no, you're our friend. We talk on the phone. We go and do things. And it's all because of the, the knife, right? The knife brought us together. And we always say this. And my wife was amazed at this because the knife community is kind of strange and not necessarily strange in the customer base. It's very strange in the knife maker, the bladesmith base, meaning you will not find a more supportive industry. I mean, guys reach out to me all the time. Hey man, how do you do this? And yet I reach out to them all the time. How'd you do this? And without hesitation, they're sending me videos. They're calling me. They're saying you need to do this, this, and this. And it's when you think about it, that's crazy because that's competition. Yeah. I could be taking that person's income. Right. But the knife community is not that way. It is the most supportive, beautiful, like everything's in sync. It's all the same purpose. Right. It's hard to tell people in other industries that, no, I could actually go to my competitors and most of them like will sit down with me yeah. and eat dinner and we'll talk knives and this is how I do it. Try it this way. Yeah, that is amazing. That is yeah. something I hear consistently um, here. And it's always interesting uh, to, to find from people who have experienced other industries uh, contrasting because, yeah, there's, yeah. there's nothing. It seems to be very... Now, of course... That, that can't be straight across the board and there are always exceptions, but sure. I have seen, you know, in the years I've been, you know, paying attention, I've seen those people get squeezed out like a yeah. splinter, you know, Absolutely. Uh, no one wants them. Um, so they, you know, they end up being pushed out. Uh, something else uh, you were saying, uh, the permanence uh, aspect of it is a huge deal. You know, you're, you're, you're making something, you're, you're putting your creativity into it. So it's kind of an artistic process or, or very much an artistic process, but you're not making art. You're making a tool um, and a beautiful tool in your case, in the case of Train Monkey, that will last uh, for generations. How does that feel? It's amazing. Uh, a really good example is I still have a three-inch case brand, leather stacked, hunting knife it's been used so much now the blade's actually like a little fillet blade but that was my grandpa's and that's what he used to hunt and skin and gut fish and prepare food at the camp and i still have that knife and i still love it and the sentimental value behind that knife is it's you know it's you can't cash that in mm -mm. and 
I also never met my grandpa. He died when I was one year old. So that is something that I take that is his. It's a connection we have. And I get told all the time by customers, I'm, you know, they want this blade and they'll use it, but it's going to become their son or their daughters. And for us, that is that blade transcribes and it jumps time. And if two generations down the road, it's still in use or it's just sitting on somebody's shelf as a display piece because they don't want their great grandpa's knife to be ruined. That's cool too. Yeah, It's a beautiful thing because the reality is, is an, and I'm very honest with people, anybody could go to Walmart now and buy a knife from Walmart, a fixed blade knife. And the truth is it's going to be a pretty good knife and it will perform and it will probably last their lifetime. I mean, a case in point, a buck knife. You could go to any Walmart and buy a 501 or a 502, a six inch clip point Bowie for 80 to $90. And that knife's going to be beautiful. It's going to perform well. And they could probably pass that down to their kids. But we need a backtrack in our case because we offer the customization for exactly what the customer wants. And when you develop that relationship with the person who made your blade, it's no different than when the samurai would go to the bladesmith and spec out a katana or a wakayaji for them. And they want it exactly the way they want it because that's just how they feel about it. And for us, that's it's beautiful. Like we couldn't ask for better. Well, yeah. And also uh, when you have a, say a trained monkey knife or another custom knife that someone has poured their uh, heart and soul into, uh, that's a reason to keep it. You know, you have no reason to keep, um, you know, the Gerber strong arm, you got it target, you know, uh, I mean, you know, it's not going to tug at the heartstrings. Uh, oh, remember, remember this knife. Uh, it'll most likely be, uh, something that's, uh, I don't know. That's a little more special. I can't believe we've gone this long and I haven't asked you to hold up some knives. I know Jim has been scrolling through your, through your website. Let's, let's see some of these beauties. So here's one that's in development. Hmm. And this is actually a collaboration blade for a big company. And we'll, we'll be releasing these soon, but this is once again, our aesthetics, that Japanese Tanto design hollow grind all the way up to the spine some serious jimping three inch blade, like a super nice little carry piece. Hmm. Stain blade, FDE, but G10 handles, olive. Gorgeous. Just a nice straight shanked, hard use. I like that. Blade. I like the tapering handle too. And the jimping that, uh, that is the guard, you know, the way the handle widens out. I like that. It is. But then we have something like this, oh. which another blade in development, six inch, more or less a drop point with a deep belly. But then we're going into stabilized woods, resin handles, customer spec, right? Brass hardware. But same thing, some super nice jimping on your thumb ramp. And just like, a pretty sleek, cool blade. Yeah, that reminds me of a um, sort of a modern take of an old fighting Bowie, you know, kind of long it and does. slender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very cool little blade. But then we have something like this. Ooh. Super thick, 530 seconds, right? 532s, inch thick. No handle scales. Once again, a Tanto with a really, really pronounced, almost swedge, yet false edge on the top. Just a real extreme hard use knife. Yeah, this one looks like a great, uh, especially with that uh, thumb ramp on the on the back, this looks like a great uh, penetrator, stabber, thruster. Sure. Yeah. And this is actually going to a military unit and hopefully they s select it as a blade. But it has to meet specs, you know, so it has to be 30,000 hours saltwater immersion with no corrosion. 
it has to uh, do 800 pound like linear stress test. So imagine this gets put into a piece of wood or between two bricks. It has to be able to support 800 pounds continuous on it with no deflection. So a lot of things that go into it that a lot of people don't realize and, you know, as they should. I mean, yeah, that's that's our job. <laughs> so is this uh, is this a uh, when they put out a, a um, call for uh, products uh, when the government uh, I can't remember what it's called, but they put out a a uh, like a solicitation. You know, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and then you came to them. This is this is my idea. This is actually like one of those cases of it's who you know, right? And we work with the individual that's in that industry. And he said, this unit's looking for this, make them a knife and I'll give it to them. Oh, cool. That so, is that, cool. Yeah, so that's cool. I mean, <laughs> it's, if the reality is with Train Monkey, more people than just me or my wife have made it possible. It's folks like you, it's our customers. It's people who have believed in us even from like the very beginning, it's people that have stuck with us and they've really opened up a lot of doors for us that, you know, it's hard. You don't, you don't necessarily know what you're capable of until somebody says, just do it. Absolutely. Sometimes that's what it takes. I, I tell my daughters that sometimes you don't think you can, you can do something. Um, like I remember the, the illustration for me was there's no way I can afford to live in that place. Yeah. And then somehow I got, I got a lease and I was like, Oh, I figured out how to do it. Yeah. That's how you do it. You keep reaching forward. Mm -hmm. um, there's another design and I can't remember what it's called. Something eater, snake, maybe? eater. snake eater. Do you have yeah. one of those handy? You know, I don't. That's a, <laughs> that I wish is a cool blade. Yeah. And it's, you it's tough, man, because even when people come to our shop, they're like, what do you have available? <laughs> and the reality is, is a person orders a knife. We make the knife for them. We send them photos and videos so they could approve of the knife. If they approve of it, it's delivered. So we don't keep anything in stock. Yeah, right. Really on hand. And even these blades are getting mailed out tomorrow. So I just kept these because I knew you wanted to see some. Oh, that's cool. Oh, thanks, Jim. Yeah, the snake eater. That is a sweet design, man. It is. I really like that. That's a yeah, and that actual one you're showing right there, that's legit 24 karat gold in the handle. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk customization for for a minute. Now you have um, Jim. If you could go back to uh, where you just were, real quick. So uh, you see all these options here when you're ordering a knife on your website, um, but you don't see an option. You know, when you scroll down to the handle material, for instance, you don't see the option for hundred dollar bills shredded and suspended in resin. So how does the mm -hmm. custom side of the house work? So the custom side of the house, it's either direct message on Instagram or my cell phone number that you could get from the website, or you can go to that order form. And if a person picks hybrid scales, there will be like another little tab that says, you know, directly reach out to us for hybrid scales or we'll reach out to them. So if they pick hybrid scales, they submit the order. There's also a note section that they could write down exactly what they want. And there's instructions on that. But most of the time, a customer just selects hybrid scales and they write nothing down. They just submit the order. And then I receive the order. And then we communicate directly with the customer. And a lot of them have ideas. They're like, I want, you know, blues and greens and I want some wood. Make it happen. But then the best customers are the ones that say, uh, creative freedom, make whatever you want. Yeah. So that's cool because there's so many ideas in our head, just always running around. Right. And like that snake eater was one of them. That was actually a local lady who purchased that blade for her husband as an anniversary gift. And she said, you know, keep it in this price range, but do what you think would be awesome. So it's like, all right, I'll keep it in that price range. Here's some 24 karat gold. <laughs> ah, oh, I like that price range. range. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, you do it a little bit differently. I got to say uh, 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 a lot of, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say a lot of people, but, but there's a, you'll see different kind of business models. And one, one that uh, 
is particularly interesting to me is uh, people who forge and then um, but also make stock removal because, as you mentioned, there just aren't too many people who are ordering forged knives or um, mm -hmm. the, the work is so much and the juice and the squeeze and all that, yeah. that you do have to do other other things. But you with this whole uh, customization thing, uh, customization angle to your business is, is really unique. And I think it's something, you know, uh, custom knife collectors should pay attention to because I think there are a lot of options, you know. There are, I mean, and the, the reality is, is the options are endless. The, a customer could say anything that they want. And as long as we can make it actually integral to the knife, meaning it performs, it functions, it's safe, we'll do it right. Uh, and that is really a, a quality and a buying point for our brand is the 100% customization. And like I said earlier in the podcast, so when I first started this, I was told by so many people, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> it's such a headache. But we've learned how to deal with the request through a streamlined process. But, you know, forge knives, forge knives, if you look at the culinary knife world, forge knives, that's where it's at. I mean, you have these, some that come off top of my head is like Hazenberg knives, GCK knives, oh, KWB knives. Their forge knives are beautiful, but they're making a limited amount because of the time and the intensity. And a lot of times you're not going to get a chef knife order for like 50 blades, but you'll get a chef or you'll get like a, this knife right here, for example, you'll get 50 of those, no problem. And you just simply, it's not feasible to forge 50 of those out. Right, right. And then but, have them be consistent straight yeah. across the board, yeah. But if a customer says, I want 50 of these with that handle, that's much, that's easier. We can make 50 custom handles, no problem. So it's just like, uh, it's a give and a take. You have to, you really have to think about what's feasible, what pays the bills, of course, but also you have to think about raw materials. And a lot of times we do one offs because we could get enough materials. But then if a customer wants, say, 50 of these with the craziest handles, if the raw yeah. material is not available, we're honest with them and we say, no, we can't do that. So honesty is also pretty big. <laughs> right. Just the boss gets the fancy handle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so as we close here, um, from your unique perspective as a, a, a small business, small family business, which I love uh, making custom knives, what advice would you give to someone who is now looking to get into knife making? Uh, what sort of advice? I would say, well, there's, there's a lot. Um, the whole concept of like buy once, cry once with equipment, mm -hmm. meaning I initially started, I made all my equipment, including my grinders. I used like a homemade anvil, homemade sanders. It was a hassle. It was a pain. I would say for most guys who really want to get into knife making, Buy the best that you can and keep it limited, meaning buy the best grinder you can and perfect your grinding before you move on to any other aspect of knife making. Hmm. Buy the best drill press that you can. Buy the best consumables that you can. Sandpaper is huge. But buy it and perfect that skill to where you're happy with it before you move on to any other skill. Because... I struggled so much trying to complete a blade when I simply wasn't happy was step A and I'm already at step Z. Hmm. So really focus on a skill at a time, whether that's truing your blades, grinding your blades, handle finishing. Another huge one is sheaths. Sheaths are extremely difficult to make a good one. Like if you're going to do kydex or leather perfect that skill before you move on and i say perfect that skill but it's really just become intimate with it 
and be happy with what you could produce. That's probably number one. Number two, and maybe this could actually be number one, make a bunch of knives and give them away to people. And that sounds counterproductive to business, but our first like 50 to 60 blades that we were actually very proud of making, we just gave away to people for free. And that sounds wild, but we gave them to individuals that we know that would give us proper, honest feedback. You need to do this differently. Try this. I like the way this looks, but I don't like the way it carries. So change it. Right. And out of those 50 people, I would say about 10 or 15 really stuck with us and have invested their time and their intellectual property into us and made us even better. So here you are, you spend $50 on raw material and you you're learning how to make a knife and you spend a weekend trying to bust out a knife and you give it away to a person. And then three years down the road, they're like, I remember you. Now I see how amazing your knives look or your business. I want to support. How can I help? And that's really helped us. It's really helped us big time. Well, there you have it. Uh, take that advice because yeah. it's uh, it's doing you some good. You can tell. Yeah. Um, Andrew Farlano of Trained Monkey Blade Co. It's been a real pleasure meeting you and talking about your awesome knives and your your cool company. Thanks for coming on the show. Bob, thank you so much. I appreciate it. From you know, from our family business, my wife and I, we really appreciate people like you. So, thank you. Uh, pleasure is mine. Take care, sir. You as well. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Farlano of Trained Monkey Blade Co. And uh, knowing my audience, if you probably know Trained Monkey, but if you don't, you got to look them up. You will love their work, uh, love his work and their work, I should say. Uh, beautiful, beautiful knives. And, uh, you know, I've been on the fixed blade craze. I, I never leave it, but I've been I've been back in this uh, in this uh, area recently and uh yeah, let's let's just say uh, take a look at the Raiden, the double edged Tonto, and uh, tell me that's not one of the coolest things you've ever laid your eyes on. All right, that does it for this episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Be sure to join us on Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives live 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, Facebook and Twitch. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast